Thank you very much. It seems like I am, no, no, no. It seems that I'm between you and coffee. I'll make sure that you don't go to sleep. And um, let me introduce myself. You know me and I know you. Because I'm going to take a different approach to the discussions here. Yes, you pronounce my name correctly, except the base. I'm by my style. I'm the executive secretary of the African Minister's Council on Water. It only happens in Africa that all the ministers come together and have a council, all the water ministers, 54, with a full secretariat to coordinate their activities, policy dialogue, and most importantly, to make sure that the people have access to water. Why am I the executive secretary? Most of you here, I believe, are academics or scientists. Can I see by show of hands the academics who are seated here? Can I? Everybody. I said the same thing two years ago in Dresden, Germany. I'm a politician. And I always challenge the academics and the scientists. I was water minister. So I deal with water politics. I deal with water diplomacy because I worked for the UN for decades until I retired. But I was trained as a scientist in university. But I've moved from science to the international arena to politics, now in international politics. I'm Carl gives me an opportunity to represent Africa worldwide. So usually when I go to water community, I said, does anybody who doesn't know me, do so, that's what I say. And I have very few people who do not know me. When I go to a place and I said, do you know me? And most of you say, we don't know you. I said, well, you are in another world. You are not in the water world. Because in the water world, for the last three years, we've been together to try to see how we can do better things to make sure that water gets to our people. Big science, of course we need science, but also being in what we call type of a global consensus. I believe in it. Look, when I saw all of the PowerPoints here, that's why I'm not doing PowerPoints. The last one, I can just take the name there and put Africa. It will stand. The one for Nepal, I can just take Nepal out and put Senegal. It will stand. So we have a common denominator, all of us. We have a common denominator. The, the, the crux of the matter is that we want people to have access to water. Is there enough water? Of course, of course. There are areas that have abundance of water that are water abundance and they are stress area. In fact, when, when, when you look at the World Economic Forum 2008 definition of water security will take you, it's either too much water or too little water in some areas. In Africa, we are only using only 3% of our water resources. I always challenge Presidents, I, ha I have the privilege of sitting with heads of states. I'm going to the summit of the AU because I take the Africa report to the heads of states, which is prepared by scientists. But our data, with due respect, with our data, we collect our data. We have uh, uh, notes in every country come our data because we have told our presidents that we do not believe in the before we do not believe in the data of the GMP because what GMP defines a decent toilet. Maybe that's decent for Europe or the developed world, but that's not what, is, what I define as decent toilet in Gambia, maybe not a decent toilet in Europe. So we have our data that we say how many people have access to decent sanitation. I tell the presidents that it's a shame anybody in your country goes to bed 
thirsty. It's a shame that 340 million Africans do not have access to water. Why are we using only 3% of our water resources? Why? And that 3%, 75% is for agriculture irrigation. 12% for industry, in which hydro is part of. And only 3% that we use for drinking water. So we have to ask our question, uh, ourselves the question, why? I also challenge them that even if you provide that water, why you provide water? I say it should be a shame that we go to the AU summit and we have bottled water. It's a shame that we go and have bottled water. The water is there. I don't know you, I was sitting next to a colleague, I saw his name, I saw South Africa. I was there two weeks ago, I always go there, and in the government, say that in government meetings, you know, it's a, it's a kind of an insult to give the people bottled water. It can come from the tap. Every year, all of, most of us who are in the international water discourse go to Sweden for the World Water Week. And in the tap, they and the toilet say, this water is good, it's portable, etc. But in Africa, in developing countries, most in Latin America and uh, 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 Asia, it's not. So we ask our question, why? There are a lot of interlinkages. It's not only science. Science can provide some of the answers. I lived in Kenya. We have seen what science has contributed. Rudimentary science. The Maasai in Kenya don't have water. You travel from Nairobi to Arusha, you are passing in Maasai land. And somebody has gone there and helped them to bake the, the water that is not portable to be manageable, to be portable. By putting it in a bottle, putting it on top of the roof, the sun hits it, the sediment settles, it becomes clearer. That's rudimentary science. In my country, in Gambia, he introduced me Gambia. I'm based in Nigeria. Because that's, I walk for the whole of Africa. That's where we are. We have a lot of water, but if you go to the eastern part of the water, it's full of calcium. It's not portable. So here is why we say we need to bring science into it. And that's why the scientists don't like me, because I always say the one thing that they don't like me. I say, but the scientists have been going to sleep. They, have not been, they, have, they wait until the train has passed before they want to join, jump into the train when the train has passed the station. Typical example I've seen here, that this meeting is to contribute to the SDGs. My co colleague from UNESCO knows about that. For the last three years, we've been contributing to the SDG. We are almost done. In fact, as we speak now, December, the last draft document will be out. So it's, it's just now negotiations not bringing anything. So what was science doing? Should they wait to be invited to the party? No. They should, be, they should know what is happening in the international discourse and plug in. They shouldn't wait for me to invite them. In Gambia, in, in Africa, I have a colleague. He's in the Africa uh, Academy of Science. When I talked of certain things about the indicators that we are developing, we are already trying to develop the indicators for the SDGs. We are already at that stage. And he said, what are you talking about? I say, you just sit in the laboratory and do your research with your students and come out with all type of theories. But the real world is that we are moving to try to get something. Some people may, be, may disagree that you can never have international consensus on certain things. But I'm a believer in it because I've seen it. I've seen the impact. I've seen the impact of the MDGs because if I talk as a politician, we politicians, we like targets. We like targets. And the target is tell me that by 2030, everybody will have access to water. That's the language we speak. So the problem I've seen in the international scene is that the scientists do not know how to communicate with the policymakers or with the politicians. As a politician, as a minister, you give me all of these drafts, graphs, and all of these PowerPoint with graphs. I say, that's all momo jumbo. What is the bottom line? So my job is to translate your science into a political language. Because these are the people who matter. These are the politicians. They're the one who is going to negotiate. Not you. When you go to New York, it's the heads of states that are going to sit down and negotiate. And they're not going to be talking about science. But they need 
They need your information. That is simple and a political language because they are politicians, they need those language. And the problem we face with, between science and the politician is that the politician has a very short lifespan. Two years, four years. He may not be there. He may not be re-elected. He may not be minister. So he wants to do everything during the period that he's made a minister. I went through that. I wanted to have as many boreholes as possible. Because I know that if I have many boreholes as possible, I'll be re-elected. I become the most popular minister during election time, one year before election. Even the finance minister, whom we say that is so important that every minister goes to him, one year before election, he comes to you, please help me with five more holes in my area. If I have that, I'll be re-elected. But what signs am I going to use to say in your area is not possible because if I do five more boreholes, you know, the water table, the aquifer has gone down and so forth. So we just have to see where the balance is. So what we need is evidence-based information, and that comes from science. Evidence-based information that comes from science. That when I sit with a president, next month I'm going to Senegal with the president of Senegal. When I sit with him, I said, because I'm trying to push something for the summit to adopt, the AU summit to adopt in water. But I need information from the scientists. So they play that important role. But that information is my role now to translate it into political terms because that's the language he understands. So the communication is very important. That's where most scientists lag behind, not uh, only in Africa, but we have noticed that in uh, Europe and different parts of the world. As we speak now, today, 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 in The Hague, there is a group sitting there, Sanitation and Water for All, SWA, for two days, they are there, talking about access to water. So we are all talking about access to water, but how come we are unable to deliver? How come? We are trying to convince the heads of states, as I don't know other, other regions, but in Africa, to say that, look here, with all your development goals, we are not talking about water now. Your development goals, you have development agenda, development goal, whether MDG or national goals and so forth, you cannot achieve without water. Water is the, is the driving force for economic growth. And we engage the economists, and they give us information. Countries where there is investment in water, we have seen the GDP going up and the economic growth and countries where we have lack of investment in water, we have seen the, what's happened to the GDP going down. And if I am to convince the finance minister to invest more on water, I need to give him that information. Because the finance minister is the minister where everybody goes to to get from the national coffers. You are competing with energy. You are competing with infrastructure. Infrastructure will beat you because the heads of states want to be roads and bridges because something physical that can solve after five years to be re-elected. In Africa, if you go to Africa now, two years before every election, you see roads are being paved. Bridges are being built. We call it infrastructure. You go to uh, 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 Africa now. You go to, you go to uh, Addis Ababa, you cannot recognize it anymore. You go to Dakar, most of the cities. Thanks, the Chinese have come and they are changing it. But that's for political gains because that's what so you are, you are competing with them. You are competing with energy. He mentioned in, in, in Nepal the power cuts. I live in power cuts. I live in power cuts. When I have electricity for 24 hours, it's a, it's a game changer. Now I'm here. I don't think there's power cut in Brazil, but it's a game changer because in my, in my country, in Africa, everywhere, you know, is, you know, power cuts. And everybody complains. So, water, you are competing with the Minister of Energy for more either hydro or more generators. So, how are you going to make sure that investment 
in water has increased so that the people will have water. Because the finance minister will tell you that, no, if I give more money to the energy minister, and he invests, people pay their electricity bill, he brings money back to me. If I give money to the agriculture minister, he'll put it on fertilizer and that the return. But what are, what are you going to give me? What are you going to give me back? What are you going to give me back? Because we have seen it as a social commodity, not an economic commodity. And that's a big debate. Should we charge for water, for drinking water? And there's a big debate now. I said, yes, we should charge. I said, no, we are charging now. But everybody knows we are not charging for the water. We are charging for the infrastructure that brings the water. I can afford in my country to water my garden. You know, wash my car three times because what I pay is so pittance compared to electricity because when my kids put the air conditioner on, I say, hey, 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 wait a minute. Don't put it on that much because it's expensive because I have to pay so much for that. But for water, it's not. So that brings us when we say that water as a human right, even the American government do not want to sign it because they say, should I provide it to everybody? That means I have to provide for everybody. And it costs a lot. So we face a challenge in the water community. I call it the water community because we move from city to city. I've been everywhere. This is my, this is my uh, uh, fourth stop. I haven't been home. Sorry for delay. I've gone and my role is a spokesperson for Africa on water. And I talk with different audiences, what do we need to do together so that the people will have water? Because where I live, the continent I'm from, and which is very similar in Latin America, which is very similar in, in, in Asia, is that the poor people either do not have access or they are paying more for water. In the city, I have pipe water with meter, and I may pay 10 cents for 1,000 liters. You move away to the poor person. He's being exploited. A merchant is coming with those yellow jerry cans of 25 uh, 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 gallons, 25 liters, selling it to them at a higher price per liter than what I pay. So we feel, as a politician, I face that challenge, say, these are the poor who are paying more if water goes there. How am I going to provide water for them? What access? How can science help me to access that water? So you, the scientists and the academics who have the knowledge and training I've looked at some of the institutions. In Africa, we are establishing centers of excellence in different regions, in different countries, universities to try to tailor meet the curriculum, science curriculum on water to meet the current realities. We are trying to do that, and we are successful in some areas. In Southern Africa, University of Stalinbosch is our center of excellence, Dakar, University of Dakar, and we have the Pan-African Water University in Algeria. And we are linking all of this so that we'll be able to provide, you know, produce enough professionals. In fact, we have said that the MDGs, you give us all the money for the MDGs, we cannot meet the MDGs on water because the human capacity that we need is not there. So we need to train. So they have to come in the institutions that will, that will train them. I said I wouldn't stand between you and coffee. What? I would like to conclude is that water costs across the board. And as I speak to you here, next week I'll be in Lima leading the Africa group on the negotiations in COP for water because that is, we have the threat of climate change, the threat of global warming on water. We have seen that uh, one of the slides that by 2030 there'll be about 40% shortfall of water, but how are we going to make use of the current water that we have so that it will be sustainable. That depends on you, the academics and the scientists to give us that answer. Thank you.